Hello, I'm Sam Chalice. I'm head of the Rock Art Research Institute at the University of the Witwatersrand in Johannesburg, but I'm from the UK. I'm here on sabbatical. I was the uh, Africa Fellow at uh, IASH here at Edinburgh earlier this year. And I'm giving this pr presentation in collaboration with my ex-doctoral student, Andrew Skinner. I've got a flashing thing here. I don't know what that is. Hopefully it's gone away. Um, who is now a postdoc at UNISA, University of South Africa. Um, together, along with others like Mark McGranahan, Alice Mullen, we have formulated a new animisms approach to San rock art that accommodates the findings of the shamanistic hypothesis, but which takes a more expansive view of the San idioms that inform their ontology. Uh, I should uh, I'll just quickly give you a couple of definitions that I came up with. Um, Animisms distribute agency and culture into the world from Descola. Uh, animism recognizes that human is not a novel category of person after Hallowell and Willislav, but rather a particular position on a spectrum of behaviors, attitudes, and relationships that humans generally occupy after Fifieros, De Castro, um, and others. In this, they are defined just as all other non human persons are. Shamanism posits that agents have the capacity to act as bridges between different states of being, not oppositional states, in our view, as opposed to some um, colleagues that have gone before, uh, the sacred versus the profane or the nature versus culture divide, but rather different positions on the spectrum of behaviors and personhood. When we look at what shamans do, it is negotiating not only with the agents that inhabit these areas, but also with the consequences um, of their own movements within it. A human is defined by the occupation of a particular position on the spectrum after uh, McGranahan and Chalice 2016, and so is, say, an eland, antelope, as well. Um, so when you move into where Elands are, spatially and ontologically, you need to deal with the fact that you are, have occupied Elands space and been occupied by it. Thus, to understand your own position, you have to understand the positions of those around you. So that's just a bit of sort of background there. Wow, it's coming up every four nanoseconds. But first, a bit on the rock art revolution of the 1970s. Frustrated by, with the quantitative approach of the new archaeology in the 60s, Patricia Vinicom and David Lewis-Williams turned to San Bushman ethnography, and I reject any pejorative connotations with either of those uh, names, San or Bushman. It depends where you are in Southern Africa, who uses what. Independently, they concluded that San rock art is religious, and this is demonstrable because elements in the art pertain to San beliefs that have been recorded in South Africa in the 1860s and the 1870s, 13,000 pages of them, uh, and the beliefs of today's extant San in the Kalahari now, and from the 1950s onwards. You can see the things happening in the rock art that the guys are doing and talking about. So we're very lucky to have that. Okay. And there they are in the 70s doing their thing. German linguist Wilhelm Blake and his English sister-in-law Lucy Lloyd recorded over 13,000 pages of verbatim testimony from Kham, San Bushman, incarcerated for stock theft at the Breakwater Jail in Cape Town, <clears throat> as well as relating mythology, customs and beliefs, they commented on sketch copies of rock art, not very good ones, uh, and interpreted them in the context of ritual and dances. The Tham at the Breakwater Jail also corroborated the words of the San man Kring who in 1873 had been a guide for Magistrate Joseph Orpen and explained paintings in situ. So it's the only time this ever happened where somebody was writing, writing it down and the San guide who knew what the rock art was about showed it to him and said, this is one of these and this is one of these. I mean, it's mind boggling. Okay, and this is in 1873. Trouble was the interlocutor didn't know what he was talking about, but thank God he wrote it down anyway. So we now, fight over what was actually he was actually talking about because we know a little bit more about it he described the dances of which you have seen paintings 
So if anyone tells you that the paintings are not of the dances and the subject matter of the dances, they're not taking this into account. In which people dance all night in a circle and perform hands-on healing. He also described the nosebleeds that the San healers get when they hyperventilate during the trance dance. There's a nice nosebleed over there on the far left. Okay, so this is in the art. I didn't make this up. This triangulates against the modern Kalahari San Bushman, whose healing dances have been the subject of anthropological attention. Not, in, not enough anthropological attention, actually. Uh, people are more interested in things like, you know, when they have their lunch. The women sing the song of a powerful animal, such as the giraffe or the eland, thus summoning its essence to the dance fire. The men, and sometimes women, dance to absorb the essence of that animal into their bodies, because only with the supernatural potency of that animal can you catapult yourself into the spirit realm. This is the shamanistic hypothesis I'm giving you as background. Um, and sometimes be feel themselves becoming that animal, hence the transformed human animal figures or therianthropes that characterize the art. And this is a, an, a, a universal. Um, so whether you like it or not, it's there. Uh, <clears throat> they dance until they reach the state of kia, whereupon their spirit leaves their body through a hole in the top of the head, and they travel to the spirit realm to appeal to their god, Kawa, among the Jukwansi of uh, Nyai Nyai and Kalahari, for the lives of the sick. They then return to the dance in a semi-conscious state and begin the work of healing, pulling arrows of sickness out of all the community members. Arrows of sickness are shot into people by spirits of the dead who are attracted to the dances. Indeed, these spirits of the dead are often painted near to or in the dances. Healers were described by Qing as being those who have died and live mostly underwater. So, so for, your, for your, to your spirit to leave your body, you have to die in the dance and live mostly underwater. And here we see a ritual specialist being nibbled by fish and eels underwater, having part transformed into the antelope whose power has been called upon. So you've got the little hoofs of the eel and antelope. He's connected by threads of light, these lines that are going in and out, to eel and antelope whose passage to or from the spirit realm is indicated by the crack in the rock face from which one eel is stepping. So I don't know if you can see that, but this one, this is deliberately painted so that it stops. That's not exfoliated. And that's quite a common feature. They're coming out of the rock face. And snakes do the same thing. They weave in and out of the rock, whether there's a step there or not. <clears throat> when pointing at this animal, Ping said to Orpen, that animal that the men are catching is a snake. And Orpen put a little exclamation mark in parentheses. Like, what is he talking about? It's not a snake. They're holding out charms to it and catching it with a long ream, which is a little leather thong. This was corroborated by Dia Quain, one of the clam in, the Cape, in Cape Town, when the copy was shown to him by Blake, many hundreds of kilometers away. Though he said that it was a water cow, far more likely sounding, seeing as it is a bovid creature of some sort. Until that is, you come to understand that for the sun, the rain, and indeed the water itself is a supernatural being. The clam called it Kwa. The water cow, water bull, was a kwajajoro, water beast, a fearsome beast that required placation with charms, usually the magical buhu plant or equivalent. Kwa is associated with many animals. Indeed, eland themselves can be ranged things. One of the most common manifestations of kwa, however, is the snake. Puff adders, particularly female ones, were said to be things belonging to kwa. Sometimes, though, kwa was the snake or the rain serpent. Thing then said that the men with the ray box heads tame elands and snakes. I had got so far as to determine that the elands stood for the game. Indeed, this forms one of Lewis Williams' central pillars. Now it seems like snakes were synonymous with water and the rain. So that the sentence translated approximately as the men with the ray box heads. Ray box is the small antelope, I'll show you in a minute. Men with the ray box heads tame the game and the rain. So these are the guys who are in charge of influencing the game animals and the weather. But what was the taming that they were doing? It seemed to have something to do with the Raybok antelope and the anthropomorphs, or therianthropes, whose heads they portrayed. Indeed, it transpired that most of the therianthropes painted in Vinicum's and Lewis Williams and Harold Parker's and everyone else's research areas, for that matter, uh, were in fact not eland therianthropes, but Raybok therianthropes, this little antelope. 
The raybok is a small to medium-sized antelope, as opposed to eland, which is the largest of all antelope. It has a long, thin neck and long, thin muzzle with a bulbous nose. It has long, leaf-shaped ears, almost vertical, slightly forward-curving horns. Unlike the eland, it is very difficult to run down, not easily hunted or herded. It is skittish and runs away at the first suggestion of danger. It seems to be its wi very wildness that makes it so special to the Maluti Drakensberg San, like Kring. However, no other, uh, other, other than Kring's words, we have no other ethnography to corroborate this. However, it seems to be somehow equivalent to the springbok for the clam. The guys in Cape Town jail spoke about the springbok in, 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 in these terms. Um, in fact, they said that if you could make the springbok behave nicely, you were an exceptional hunter. And these specialists were given antelope-eared caps, and literally a hat with ears on it, to mark you out as insignia that you are a shaman of the game. Here we see some painted examples of those antelope-eared caps, except these are in the Maluti Drakensberg, so they're arguably more likely to be made from Rayburg. In fact, you can see something of the relationship between the therianthropes and the game shaman. So the guys over there with the little caps on, and the person transforming with the nosebleed in the dance. Notice how the Raybok therianthrope in the center of the bottom picture is an antelope from one angle, but if you see it facing right, it's an upright humans with their arms in a backwards dancing posture. Three of the four figures bleed from the nose, caused by hyperventilation. The clown spoke of particular individuals who had the ability to make animals behave nicely, to influence them. They were referred to as opwaiten kliten. So kli is the supernatural potency, and the kliten are the people who have it and can master it. These specialists wore springbok eared caps. Individuals with power to influence the rain, they called kwa kagliten. So somebody who can influence kwa, the rain animal, and the rain is, a, is one of these kliten who can do it. In rock art, these figures also wear antelope eared caps. I better speed up. Mark McGranahan tra transcribed all 13,000 pages of the archive to into a type format that can be searched. From this, we can see patterns emerge. One of the patterns he noticed was that wildness, which occurred throughout the archive as an undesirable quality and was used both, uh, uh, it occurs throughout the archive as an undesirable quality and was used of both animals and people. People who were wild were those who, like lions, did not observe food sharing protocols and thus introduced disharmony and danger to the collective. So it's dangerous stuff if you're a hunter-gatherer group. When I asked him about what he thought of Kling's use of the expression tame, he juxtaposed this against what the clams say is wild. That is to say, tame animals are those with whom one has established a relationship through correct behavior. Willingness to be approached. Whoops. I don't know why I did that. By observing Nana say avoidance or respect words, by smelling in the right way, by approaching with what they call understanding behavior, which is different for each animal, they can influence an animal's behavior to achieve a desired outcome. The taming in idiom is best understood as part of a worldview or ontology which sees wild attitudes, nervousness and flightiness versus tame attitudes of calm behavior, willingness to be approached or even foolish fear that will get you trapped. So if an animal is behaving foolishly, you can get it. It is inculcated by specific people with specific skills in specific domains. Um, other patterns observed by McGranahan, such as alterity, people being different, uh, monstrosity linked to the wildness, but with extreme representations and disastrous results, prompted him to investigate in parallel anthropologies in which similar idioms were expressed. I was already familiar with the work of Rane Willislev because of his treatment of the remnants of shamanism among Siberian Yukagir and Tim Engold for a hundred reasons. But when Mark suggested I read scholars such as Deskola and Bird David, first I said, no, don't worry about it, I'm fine, thanks. But, uh, but what much of what they were saying chimed with what I knew of San ethnography, so it seemed to fit, it worked. Um, uh, Rock art researchers such as Robert Wallace have also picked up on this, and preeminent Kalahari anthropologist Matthias Gunther is also convinced of the efficacy of new animisms in Southern African rock art research. 
Southern African Saan forager worldviews exhibit topo-ontological domains characterized by persons who are human and persons who are not. There are places that are the realms of There are places that are the realms of certain persons and their concordant ways of being, inhabitants characteristic of the place and vice versa. Human persons are those who occupy the human range of territory and behaviour, while non-human persons are those who occupy theirs respectively. An animal is what it is for being in certain habitats and expressing behaviours of the things you might expect to meet in such a place. Therefore, if a place is where one might expect to find snakes, or serpents, or creatures of the rain, then one must behave accordingly, showing oneself to be what one is, preferably as a human person that has already brokered relationships with those entities and can approach with understanding. So it is an idiom of respectful behaviours that enables hunters, rainmakers and healers to have influence with other than human entities on the landscape, a brokering of relations that requires knowledge of a place and its inhabitants and how to treat with them what to expect them to do, and what to expect from them. Um, it's not quite my last slide, but I can show you all these images of what we would say that are non-real things happening, of people um, metaphorically taming the game. Thank you very much.